Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Want to just do some problems? Tell me the other five trig functions of the beta. The other five trig functions. Mm. In other words, given one trig function, and, and this is what I think one of these meant, expressing trig functions in terms of others, no, using definitions of trig functions, probably this one right here is what they're talking about. And this is definitely something I think we've done, or you've done. Okay. Very first step, draw a right triangle. What can you do? I'm a little bit of a hard time hearing you, Max. Oh, let me... It's, it's a little blurry or what about now? distorted. What about now? A little better, I think. Hello. Ah, that's good. Okay. Are you using a headset? Yeah. My my computer sound isn't working, so... Okay. Well, whatever you're using now sounds the best, the quality-wise. <laughs> Let me make sure I got this recording going. Yeah, I do. Okay. So whenever you're given a trig function and its value, and they ask you about other trig functions... First steps, always to draw a right triangle and label theta. If I don't label theta, I can't do it because theta could be up here. And I can label either of the acute angles as theta. I usually choose the bottom one. And now, how can I label that triangle? The left side is 5 and the hypotenuse is 6. So what's the... Other side, what's X? Um, uh, uh, square root of 11? Correct. Did you go back all the way to the Pythagorean theorem to solve that? Yeah. Okay. It might be worth you memorize. In other words, you have to solve right triangles so frequently that when I see this problem here, I don't go all the way back to C squared equals A squared plus B squared. It's just too lengthy. And then you have to do the algebra and everything else. What I remember is that any short side of a right triangle is equal, the answer always begins square root, the hypotenuse squared minus the other short side squared. And I go from that point there. Okay. Okay. So here we're solving for a short side. It's the square root of 36 minus 25. Get to square root 11 rather quickly. And... The other one is when you're solving for the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always, always begins square root, and it's one short side squared plus the other short side squared. Notice the difference. If you're solving for a short side, subtraction's going on in there, and if you're solving for the hypotenuse, addition is going on. Okay. okay, so this was square root of 11. Now it's cosine of theta. 11, square root of 11 over 6. And tangent theta. Tangent theta is uh, 5 over square root of 11. Can you give that as an answer? Yes? No. You have an irrational denominator. Okay? When you have an irrational denominator, you have to rationalize it. 
In other words, you, you really would lose points if you gave that as an answer. Uh, and the answer is not to turn it into a decimal. That's also not an exact answer. But if I, do you know how to rationalize that? It's called rationalizing the denominator. No. Multiply top and bottom by whatever this is. Okay. In other words, I can always multiply any fraction by the number one. Well, in this case, my number one is square root 11 divided by square root of 11. And now what I get is five square roots of 11 in the numerator, and I get 11 in the denominator. And now I have a rational denominator. I have an okay. irrational numerator, but that's okay. That's perfectly acceptable. Okay. And okay. this is one of the things about trig. I'm glad, I'm glad we came across this because you frequently have to rationalize your denominators. What is this equal to? Square root of 3 over 3. Okay. What is that equal to? Uh, 9 over 3? Not 9. I'm multiplying. Oh, oh, um, 3. It's 3 over square root of 3. I mean, square root of 3 over 3. It's 1. I'm going to multiply it by this. And I get 3 root 3 in the top. I get 3 in the bottom. Those cancel. There's my answer. Just root 3. Okay. Okay. What is the secant of theta? The secant of theta is well oh, six over let me write it. It's gonna be six over the square root of eleven, but Bless you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, multiply both by. It's going to be 6 times the square root of 11 over 11. Right. And now I can't reduce that any. But you always want to see whether you can reduce that, like we did with the 3. Right. And cosecant of theta is 6 over 5. And cotangent of theta. That is square root of 11 over 5. Okay. Now, one thing I, I struggle with a little bit working with you is I'm never sure what the degree of difficulty you've gone uh, is. Uh, this is almost the definitive problem in trigonometry, the ability to take one trig function and figure out the other five. Okay? Now, the one thing that might be added is this is in the third quadrant. In other words, they might tell you Theta is greater than uh, pi and greater than or equal to pi and less than or equal to 3 pi over 2. Okay? And this would be the whole problem. In other words, figure out the other five trig functions based on that. Well, you do it exactly the same way. Don't make the mistake of uh, drawing the unit circle and trying to find the reference angles. Just draw a triangle, a right triangle, label theta, go through the exact same process. It's still the same triangle, but now because we're in the third quadrant, the only thing that changes on any of these answers is the plus or minus sign. 
Okay. And incidentally, I guess this can't be in the third quadrant, but it can be in the second quadrant uh, because the sign is positive. Okay. So we'll make it in the second quadrant. I wouldn't be surprised to see you tested on this now that you've had the unit circle. So okay. if the sine of theta equals 5 sixth in the second quadrant, cosine of theta is what? Cosine of... Uh... All these numbers are going to be the same. So okay. the only thing you have to change is the plus or minus yeah. sign. Right. If it's in the second quadrant, then it's going to be negative cosine. About tangent. Tangent is going to be negative, too. Secant? That's going to be positive. No, secant is negative. Cosecant. Cosecant will be positive. And cotangent is negative. Okay. And that is really kind of the quintessential trig problem, is where they give you the trig function and tell you what quadrant it's in. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, but all of those require you to solve a lot of right triangles. Uh, speaking of right triangles, my 30, 60... One square root of three, two. The 45, 45, a lot of school systems label this a little different than I do. I label it one, one square root of two. But notice what that produces. What's the sign of 45 degrees? The sign of 45 degrees is... Um Is it one half? One over root two. Oh, root two. Right? One over the hypotenuse. Right, right. Which needs to be rationalized. So it's root two over two. Because we take sine and cosine so frequently, more so probably than secant and cosecant, a lot of school systems now label this as square root of 2, square root of 2, 2, which is this, this okay. In other words, my labels are mere ratios. It's any multiple of those that matter. In other words, right. 30, 60 can also be a 10, 10 root 3, 20 triangle. And the reason they will present this to you as a unit triangle is because it makes sine and cosine ready rationalized. In other words, now the sine of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2. It's already rationalized. Okay. So this can be sometimes more helpful. But, of course, if I said what's the secant of 45 degrees, well, now that becomes 2 over and I got to rationalize it again. And now rationalizing it gets a little more complicated. So the secant is just root 2, which you'd have gotten directly had this thing been labeled with my numbers. Not my numbers, but I mean, I like to think of these two triangles as unit triangles, just like the unit circle always has a hypotenuse of 1, my unit triangles always have the short side as 1. And I go from there. Okay. Um, how about exercises 6 and 7 here? Okay. Does this look appropriately difficult for you. Let's do a couple of them. We won't have to do all of them if you can do them real quick. And tangent of 150 degrees. And so that's, that's 30 degrees. Okay. 30 degrees. Um, so what's the tangent of 30 and what's its sign going to be? 
So we have the tangent of 150, and then I like to write the reference angle in there, like that. Right. And so what's the tangent of 30? So sine of 30 is... Not sine, tangent. Well, it's sine of 30 over cosine of 30. What? I don't have tangent for those. Oh, really? Yeah. Look at that triangle. What's tangent of 30? It's, it's much easier to memorize tangent than it is to do it the way you are going to do it than to turn it into sine over cosine. Uh, so it's 1 over square root of 3, right. which is 3 over, it's just square root of 3. No, it's square root of 3 over 3. Let's talk about that. You, you can get so you can memorize these. 1 over square root of 2 is square root of 2 over 2. 1 over square root of 3 is square root of 3 over 3. 1 over square root of 5 is square root of 5 over 5. Okay? So the 1 over square root of 3 turns into square root of 3 over 3. So that's what the tangent of 30 degrees is, is square root of 3 over 3. And that's the absolute value. What's its plus or minus sign? It's negative. About the cosine of 4 pi over 3. And you can do these two ways. You can convert the degrees and solve it. Or you can try to work in radians, which once you get good at radians, it's faster that way. But if you're not good at radians, it probably makes sense to convert that to degrees first. I, I don't know. What do you do? Do you generally convert? Yeah, I generally. I mean, it depends on the question, but like with this, I would convert because I don't know the value of Go ahead, pi over. Go ahead and convert it. Let's do it that way. doesn't really matter. It's going to take you just an extra... 10 seconds to convert it. So it's 240 degrees. Okay. And the reference angle. And the reference angle for that is um, sixty degrees. And the cosine is sixty degrees. Cosine of 60 degrees is um, 2 pi over 2. No, uh, sorry. Uh, one half. One half. Okay. So let's go back to that tangent of 30 degrees. You wanted to do sine over cosine. Well, the sine of 30 is one half. Cosine of 30 is square root of 3 over 2. And now you have to solve that by flipping the denominator and multiplying. So you get to 1 over square root of 3, but a lot more steps, really, than, in other words, you don't have to memorize the tangent. So all you have to do is memorize those two triangles. And then you can figure out your tangent directly. You don't have to use the quotient identity. All right. What's the plus or minus sign on my cosine of 4 pi over 3? It's plus. No, it's, it's minus. Wait, all. Yeah, no, never mind. It's minus. Cosine of pi over 6. Now, when you have radian functions like this, where the numerator is just pi, it's 1 pi, it's really easy to convert that to degree. Right. What is that? That is uh, 30 degrees. Yeah, and the reason here is the reason it's so easy. You don't really have to apply your conversion formula. So all you have to know is that the denominator times this number is 180. Right. 
So pi over 3 is 60. And, and these are, this is a good way to get your mind thinking in terms of radians. Pi over 3 has to therefore be 60 degrees. And pi over 4 has to be 45 degrees. And if you kind of memorize these three, then notice that to do 2 pi over 3 isn't that tough. If pi over 3 is 60, 2 pi over 3, that must be 120. Okay. And 4 pi over 3, well, just 4 times 60. So I can get to 240 faster than you can get to 240 by using the conversion factor pi over 180 or 180. Right. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I usually don't even write it out. I know that pi really isn't even... I know that it's going to cancel either way, so I just multiply it by the numerator and divide by the denominator. Okay. And I can the answer. Okay. But this really is quite helpful. If you get these so you automatically know these, then it makes handling other radians easier. Right. Um, so what's cosine of 30? Cosine of 30 is... Um, That's three square root of three over two. Uh huh. And I would say and you do want to memorize these. You want to memorize the sine and cosine of thirty and sixty. Yeah. And forty-five. So right. you don't have to think for five seconds. You should instantly know the cosine of forty-five is square root of two over two or the cosine of 60 is the same as the sine of 30, one half. And the square root of 3 over 2 comes up a lot because that is the sine of 60 and it's also the cosine of 30. And that's not accidentally incidental. That's what the definition of cofunctions are. The sine of theta always equals the cosine of 90 degrees minus theta, no matter what theta is. Right. And all of the cofunctions share this property. In other words, this relationship holds true between tangent and cotangent and secant and cosecant. That's what cofunction really means, is those functions. Okay, and that was a first quadrant angle, so we knew it was in positive. About uh, sine of 7 pi over 6. That's 30 degrees times 7. Good. I like That's doing it that way. That's an easier way than doing it the other way, isn't it? Right. Okay, and what's the reference angle? The reference angle is um, it's always the bit that is beyond 180. Right. So it's, th it's 30 degrees? Right. Sine of 30. Sine of 30 is 1 half. And the plus or minus sign. I wrote this wrong, incidentally, at the beginning. I wrote 7 pi over 3. I meant to write 7 pi over 6. Uh, I wasn't looking at what you wrote. I was looking no, at I know. You got it right. <laughs> you turned it into 210 degrees correctly. Uh, um, so is that plus or minus? It's negative. Okay. All right. Uh, let's do some inverse. It's the inverse sine of negative 1. Should I just plug that in my calculator? No, no. No, please don't use your calculator. This is definitely a non-calculator section. Whenever you're seeing numbers like this, every one of these numbers you see can be gotten from those two triangles. Okay. Well, this one's a little different. 
this one, what you really want to be able to do is draw the sine curve. Okay, where is it equal to minus 1? At its lowest point, that's... Um, what is that point on the x-axis? On the x-axis, that's uh, th square root of 3 over 2. Well, you're close. It's 3 pi over 2. Whenever you're drawing a sine curve, and, and you're going to get into this deeper in trig uh, when you study the sinusoid function, but the first thing you want to do is, is quarter this up because sometimes this is 2 pi, but with some equations it's 6 pi or 8 pi or pi over 2. Uh, it's only 2 pi for y equals sine of x. In other words, if I have y equals sine of 2x, it doesn't go out to 2 pi. It only goes out to pi. Okay. Okay, but the primary task is to quarter this thing up, and you do that by starting at the end of the period. And that makes... And the middle point is pi. Right. So in between those two is pi, 2, two pi over... Oh. Okay, yeah. That's the midpoint, this midpoint. Then pi over 2. Right, okay. And these are your four most common quarter points, and it's also important that you put the starting point on there, because it isn't always zero. Um, so actually there's five points you always want to put on that curve. So okay. where is, what's the answer to this? The answer to that is 3 pi over 2. Correct. And you can put it in either degrees or radians. They didn't specify. So since we tend to memorize this graph in radians, at least I do, I, maybe you don't. You might label this 90 degrees, 180, 270. No, I memorized this in radians. What's that? I did memorize this in radians. Okay. So. Most people do by the time you get to this thing. So it's easier to give your answer in radians rather than having to take that and then convert it to degrees, which there's no need to do if they didn't request the answer in degrees. The key thing is every one of these questions we're solving for an angle. Okay. Okay. So what's the inverse sine of minus 1 over root 2? Minus 1 over root 2. Mm -hmm. So Okay, wait. Now the fact that this has not been rationalized is perfectly fine. Okay. It's not a final answer. You, the only time you have to rationalize fractions is when you're presenting them as a final answer. Okay. This number, incidentally, 1 over root 2 in your calculator will give you exactly the same as this number. Okay. It's just a mathematical practice to not have irrational denominators or imaginary denominators. You haven't gotten to imaginary numbers yet, but once you do, you can't have those in the denominator either. Because okay. it doesn't really, the process of division is one where I'm dividing a number by something, and square root of 2 is not really anything we can divide anything up into. <laughs> So that's why you don't want rational, irrational numbers in the denominator. But okay. when you're doing inverse, that's what they gave you. You don't need to rationalize that first. Let's look at our triangle. That's 1, 1, root 2. So what's the angle that they're referring to? The absolute What's the reference angle they're referring to? 45 degrees. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. However, it's got a negative sign in it. So where is sign negative? Uh, second quadrant. 
No, third quadrant. it's positive in the second. It's negative in the third and the fourth. The principal angle is the fourth quadrant angle. Let's talk about that for a second. The answer is the fourth quadrant angle, not the third. Okay. Okay. And the reason is, is that when you're looking at inverse trig functions, they've all had their domains affected so that if I'm taking the inverse sine of a positive number, it's going to be a first quadrant angle. If I'm taking the inverse sine of a negative number, it's definitely going to be the fourth quadrant angle. So I know I'm in the fourth quadrant. And I know it's 45 degrees, so it basically is that angle, right? Okay. You see how I get 315? Yes, but... However, that's not what your calculator is going to give you. Your calculator is going to give you minus 45 degrees. So that's the same thing. It's the same thing, and it's a fourth quadrant angle, which you want. And it'll always give you negative. It will never give you the coterminal positive angle. Okay. Okay. And that is true for sine and tangent. They, you, your positive answers are first degree, first quadrant answers, and your negative numbers are fourth quadrant negative angles. So okay. you, if you were taking a test, and this was on there, and you gave this 315 degree answer, you probably would get full credit. But you might not. You, you might need it as a negative angle. I don't know. It, it, uh, I would say I would give full credit to either of these because, like you said, they're the same thing. But when you, start, when you do start using your calculator to get these instead of trying to figure them out on your own, the calculator will always give you the negative angle for both sine and tangent. Okay. Okay. Now, cosine's a little different. If I said, let's just look at this same problem here, and I said, what is the inverse cosine of negative 1 over root 2? Well, that angle is still 45 degrees. But which quadrant is it in? Which quadrant? is this going to be in? Um, cosine is negative where? Cosine is negative in the second and the fourth. Second and the third. But oh, right. the principal one is the second. Why? How do you determine that? Well, it was determined when they, without getting, spending too much time explaining it to you. Let's take sine, first of all. I can't take an inverse of that. That's not one-to-one -one function. If I take an inverse of it, it won't pass the vertical line test. Okay. So what they did was they restricted the domain from there to there, which is one-to-one. -one. It does pass the vertical line test. And its inverse now looks like something like that dotted line. But notice, this is sine. This is the first quadrant. This is the fourth quadrant. That's minus pi over 2. And that's why the answers always come negative, because they're going to give you the negative angle. Okay, and remember, this is sine. 
of x. So its inverse, inverse sign, is going to have positive answers in the first quadrant, negative answers in the fourth quadrant. But observe, and this was arbitrary among mathematicians, they could have divided it up between this point and this point. That's also one to one. And we could be talking about the second and third quadrants always. So it was somewhat arbitrary that they decided to restrict the domain to the first and fourth quadrant, but it had to be continuous. They wouldn't have been able to restrict the domain to the first and the third. I don't okay. get a function. I don't get a function that passes the vertical line test. Well, if I do this same analysis with cosine, notice that with cosine, if I restrict it from there to there, I have a one-to-one -one function. That is quadrant one and two. So all positive values of cosine will come out in quadrant one. Excuse me. All inverse cosines of positive numbers will come out in quadrant one. All inverse of cosine numbers will come out negative in quadrant two. Okay. So that's why cosine is one and two, the answers to the inverses, and sine and tangents are one and four. So this isn't a 45 degree angle we're looking for. What is it? A negative. Oh. Negative. No, negative means it needs to lie in the second quadrant. What is the equivalent angle in the second quadrant that gives you this as a reference angle? Three. Not three, second quadrant. Second quadrant. So Here, let me help you a little bit. Second quadrant is 180 minus theta. Fourth quadrant is three. This is what the reference angles are. Right. It's 135. Okay. And what you're always going to do when you're working backwards here, you're going to say that 180 degrees minus theta is equal to 45. Now to solve for theta, you get 135. Right. Okay. So, and that, that gets a little tricky sometimes. When you know the angle... When you know the reference angle and you're trying to find the large angle, you almost have to plug it into that formula there. And depends on which quadrant you're in. You may be plugging it into this one. Uh, okay, I think it's worth our while to uh, go through these, each one. Let's see, we, we did that one. What is the inverse tan of 1 over root 3? Inverse tangent of 1 over root 3. So, okay, so root 3, is that 1, 2, square root of 3 triangle? Is that a 30, 60, 90? Uh-huh. That's the okay. triangle you want to reference, yes. That triangle will always tell you the answer to this question. So 30, 60, 90. One is across from thirty. Two is across. So, so ask yourself the tangent of what angle wait, is equal to one over root three. Wait a sec. What's that? Isn't isn't square root of wait? Isn't square root of three across from ninety degrees? No. The two is.
The hypotenuse always has to be the biggest num side. Right. Okay. Two, um, is, two is bigger than square root of three. Square root of three is one point seven or something. So okay. So the tangent. So. So what's the answer to this? Thirty degrees. And that's correct because it's positive. In other words, this number is positive, so our answer is going to be first quadrant. What if it was this? Minus. In other words, you're taking the inverse tangent of minus 1 over root 3. That would be in... Fourth quadrant. So what's the angle? Minus. Degrees. No, not really. I mean, go ahead and if you do that in your calculator right now, it'll tell you minus 30 degrees. It will not give you the positive coterminal angle. And I'm not sure which answer is going to satisfy your test or your teacher, but the safest one is to use the negative angle. All right. And it's the easiest one. It didn't require any math for me to put a negative sign there. Whereas you had to subtract that number from 360 degrees. Okay. Okay. So if you have a negative argument for your inverse function, try to remember to give your answer as a negative fourth quadrant angle. And it's always the same angle, just with a negative sign. What's the inverse tan of negative root 3? 60 degrees. Negative 60 degrees. Good. Good. And the inverse cosine of 1. Um. Inverse cosine of one. Square root of two, one over the square root of two. Remember, you're looking for an angle. Don't get confused. Oh, sorry, forty-five oh, degrees. Oh, yes, always. When I look at trig functions, I know I'm getting an angle. But when I look at inverse trig functions, I mean, I meant the other way around. When I look at first <laughs> trig functions, I know all these answers have to be angles. Right. Okay. What would you say it was? 45 degrees. Okay. Negative 45 degrees. Look at the graph. It's not negative. Um, first of all, it's a positive one. Which angle is the co? This is the cosine of theta. Y equals cosine of x. Which angle is the cosine equal to 1? Which angle is the cosine equal to 1? The angles are on the horizontal Zero. axis. Huh? 0. 0, exactly. And 2 pi. Right. But uh, usually they'll limit your domain here to 0 and less than 2 pi. So you never answer 2 pi to this. It's always 0. Even though 2 pi is a correct answer also. But notice one other thing. Uh, as opposed to most every other inverse trig function, all of these have a principal quadrant for positive and negative. But in reality, this one has two places. Third and fourth quadrant would actually be legitimate answers for this. But when you're dealing with these numbers 1 and minus 1, there's only one place on this where that occurs. And that's right there. Okay? Okay. Whereas if I said 45 degrees, well, that occurs there and again right there. 
So anything right. other than ones or minus ones, we're actually going to have two quadrants. Not that that's the answer you want to give. It, you know, it, it kind of depends. I don't think in this particular problem they gave us any domain restriction. Hold on a second. Let me look. Give the exact values to the following. Yeah, see, they're not giving us that uh, the angle has to be between 0 and 2 pi. And if they don't say that, then you are supposed to give just the principal angle, not both of them. In other words, that's why you give first and second quadrant only for cosine, inverse cosine, and first and fourth quadrant only for inverse sine. All right, let's see. This doesn't have anything uh, on it that we want to look at. Let me see real quickly. Um, most of the stuff is higher level trig. Um, any of these going to give you a problem? How are you going to do number 27? We got to solve for A and B. You use the law of huh? cosine? Right triangles. You do not use the law of sines or the law of cosines. Ever. It's a 30, 60, 90. Okay. And then, yeah, this is liable to be a problem on your test for sure. Think of your trig functions. So, okay, it's a 30, 60, 90, so the... Lay out your trig functions starting with the trig function on the left. Always. So you have to choose which trig function you're going to use and which angle. I'm going to, let's do the cosine of 60 degrees. Okay, good. In other words, the cosine of 60 degrees is going to relate one of these numbers and one of these letters, right? Right. And now you can solve for B. And then, okay. Okay. How would you solve for A? Let's say I said well, solve for A first. Then I would do um, tangent of 60 degrees. Equals what? Equals A over 5. Correct. Now, that's actually simpler to solve for it because you made sure your variable ended up in the numerator. Whereas right. the previous problem, you're actually going to have to do a lot more algebra to get the answer. So convenience of trig function is a factor here. Right. This was the easiest way to set it up. I could have actually set it up numerous ways. I could have said the sine of 30 is equal to 5 over B, right? But notice now that's a lot harder to solve. I got to take the B up here, and then I got to divide both sides by the sine of 30. So it's actually two steps to get to this, whereas if my B were in the numerator, where you, I could put it in there if I wanted to use secant or cosecant, but who wants to use those? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so I would use sign here and just do the algebra. Uh, although I kind of like the way you did it better. The tangent of 60 is A over 5. That's one less step. Okay. Let's see. Let me shrink this a little bit.
28 is very similar. It gives you one dimension and one angle. and wants you to solve for the other two sides. You're good on that? Yeah. 29. That's an E? I guess that's E. <laughs> well, I know that that's equal to two, uh, 2 times square root of 2. Right. That's that side there. So what's F? Right. So what's F? Well, you can use... Let me see. Can you use the Pythagorean theorem? Probably is the easiest way, because they don't really give us any angles. But right. they do... Oh, in fact, this is really weird. They give us hash marks indicating that that's the same as that. Right. But they use the letter E. Who uses the letter E as a variable? E is, <laughs> e is one of the most famous. That's like using pi as a variable. E is one of the most famous numbers in math, one of the two most important ones. So that's not the Greek letter E. That's the English letter E. So what is E? E is 2 times square root of 2. And what is F? Um, Let's do one real quick. So eight, two times. So that's four plus four equals eight square root of eight. Mm, see, I can't do it all in my head like you. I got to do it this way. Just to make sure I don't make any mistakes, because it's not that easy squaring each of these. What's that squared? Four. No. No? Mm -mm. It's you got to square both eight? things. Yeah. It's, is it eight? Yeah, it's two squared times square root of two squared. Well, two squared is four times that, so that's eight. Plus so f eight. is four. So exactly, f is four. The square root is sixteen. All right, let's see. We got just three minutes. Let's see if I can find anything different on here. Um, 14, they only give you the hypotenuse, but they tell you that angle is the same as that angle. So what kind of triangle is this? I saw, please. It's a 45, 45. 45, 45, 90. Now, let's just... Go through this math again. So, what are the two sides? And I don't need trig to do this. I could use trig. It might be actually easier to use trig, but not really. What we really have here is two similar triangles, right? I mean, triangles are similar to one another if they have the same all the angles are the same. And this is a 45, 45, 90, and so is this. So how do I figure out what that side is and that side is? Based on just geometry of similar triangles. They're equal to each other. They're not equal. They're similar. Oh, okay. I is equal to J, correct. I is equal to J. Um, let's do it using the fact that this triangle is similar to this triangle. Okay, so let's you set up a ratio. Similarity ratio. That's the similarity. Next. Go ahead. Is we could do. I mean, it doesn't matter which way you do it, but fourteen over j. No. Fourteen no. over root two. In other words, when you're figuring out the similarity ratio, you have to find the hypotenuse of the other triangle, and the hypotenuse is square root of 2. Okay. So what I'm doing is trying to, when I say similarity ratio, I'm trying to figure out every side of this similar triangle as a ratio to its corresponding side in this similar triangle. And if I can figure out that ratio, then I can answer J and I instantly. Okay. Okay, there's my similarity ratio. I'm going to multiply it by 1. So this is 14 over root 2. That's what I is. And, of course, we have to rationalize it. 
So it becomes 14 root 2 over 2, and then that has to be simplified. That's 7 root 2. So there's your answer. Okay. For I and J. Now, is it I, I and, go ahead. Like, I know they're just using it as a variable, but later on, isn't that an imaginary number? Yes, also. That's another good reason why not to use it as a variable. Now, it might have actually been easier to solve this using trick, right? In other words, uh, I can say that the um, sine of 45 degrees, because I know these angles, is equal to I over 14, which means I is 14 times sine of 45. Sine of 45 is root 2 over 2. So I actually get there a little quicker if I do use trig. It's not as hard to do the logic of similar triangles, but uh, that's certainly a geometry skill that you want to maintain, is how to solve similar triangles. And that's the way you do it, is to find the similarity ratio. Right. And go from there. But this kind of shows us that trig is a little faster. All right. Okay, awesome. Okay. So, I, I mean, <clears throat> I feel prepared. Yeah, I think you are. I think you're prepared. Um, just be confident. You yeah. Know, you know this stuff. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Max. Good All luck right. on your test. I'll talk to you next time. All right.